Hey, good morning, Life Tour. Are you ready to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning? Come on, let's put our hands together like this. Yeah. yeah. All over this room. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us and your mercies that have been renewed this morning. Thank you, God. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. You set my feet on higher ground So here I stand You are my God Your faithfulness My solid rock I give thanks for all you have done And I will sing of your mercy and your love Your love is the faith
creation calls all to the Savior. We are alive for your praise in earth and sky. No one is higher. Our God of wonders, you reign. Come on, turn that today.
salvation. You broke the curse for our freedom. Oh, Jesus, you alone. If you would, go ahead and take your communion elements. I love that song. Just It's talking about Jesus alone is one that's worthy, he's holy, the one that the angels sing about, the one that we celebrate, at, especially at this time during Christmas. That first piece in there is this, this wafer that just represents the body of Christ, his life, him being a human here on earth. Last night I was talking to my kids and we were talking about Christmas and, was, and we were saying, man, he experienced all the things that we experience and because of that, we can trust him because he's done life the same way that we have. And his body was broken and his body was given as a sacrifice for us, but his life was lived as, as an example of a way that we should live our lives. And so as we take this bread, I want us to thank Jesus for what he's done, but also Evaluate our own life. Say, God, am I living? Is my life and my body representing a way that Jesus honors you? So let's take this first element. Thank God for His life, for His body. The next thing here is this juice, which rep represents the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the thing that frees us from sin. It brings us salvation. It brings us healing. It brings us hope. Because of the blood of Jesus, I can approach the throne and say, God, I'm, I, I'm here. And so as we, we drink this and we say, you know what, Jesus, thank you so much for shedding your blood and paying the price for my sins. I love Christmas time. We get to remember that Jesus came as a baby, but then he grew up and he died on a cross for our sins. And they tried to bury him, but he wouldn't stay dead. We serve a risen savior, but his blood was shed for our sins. So let's just close our eyes for just a minute. Thank Jesus. Jesus, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you for your body that was lived, God, in just a perfect way as an example for us. God, we thank you for your blood that was shed for our sins. God, we accept your forgiveness and freedom. 
God, we want to do our very best to live a life that honors you. Let's go ahead and take this. It's just a way to worship God. Let's just sing this song one last time. Sing it out big and loud. you are so good just tell him take a moment tell him tell him Jesus we love you God you are amazing we worship you you are worthy of all of our praise God help us to never take for granted that we get to come into this place and to seek your face God God be with us this morning bring joy bring peace God, we thank you and praise this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, welcome to LifePoint Church. We are so glad to have you. My name is Mark. I get to serve here on staff. And today is going to be a great day. We are so glad that you're here with us during this Christmas season. How many of you guys have your shopping done? Yeah, not me. Uh, not for a while. Hey, one thing I want to bring attention to, in just a few minutes we're going to take our offering, but... If you need prayer today, we've got prayer cards in the seat backs in front of you. Man, fill out a prayer request. And on Tuesdays, we pray over all those needs. And you're invited to join us here on Tuesdays at 9 o'clock. We spend some time worshiping God, and then we pray for the needs of our church. And so if you've got a prayer need, man, fill that card out. We will be praying for that need. There's nothing like prayer. And we believe in the power of prayer, and we want to pray with you for those needs. All right? Hey, our ushers are going to come on down. They're going to pass these buckets. Go ahead and drop your communion and uh, trash in there. Uh, but for now, why don't you go ahead and tell somebody, say happy Sunday. I'm glad you're here. Give them a high five, shake their hands, and go ahead and have a seat. What's up, everybody? Good morning. How y'all doing this morning, this Sunday? Welcome to LifePoint Church. Such a pleasure to be with you. How many of you are thankful for communion? I just love every time we take communion together as a church family. Uh, next Sunday is our big Christmas service weekend, and so very excited for that. If you would, please uh, go ahead and get your invitations out for that and have some come with you. In fact, Saturday night, we will be doing a dream team service. So 5.30 on Saturday, everyone who serves anywhere in our church will have a service for you on Saturday night because many of you will be serving uh, all day on Sunday and love for you to give up your seat in, uh, in whatever service you're in, especially if you're on a dream team and just serve in that service instead because we, we are planning on a lot of guests next weekend. My name is Mike, I get to serve as lead pastor. I wanna say welcome again to all of you, especially, hey, if this is your first time here, if you're a first time guest or first time back in a really long time, we wanna welcome you first and foremost. Life Point, can we give it up for our guests today? We're so glad you're here. Hey, welcome and everybody joining us online through our live stream. We're grateful to be one church in many places. I'm going to invite our ushers to come down and uh, we got a lot to get through in the service today, um, but I want to give you opportunity to give. And let me just thank you on the front end. Uh, last Sunday, we had our once a year uh, prepared offering. We call it our heart for the house offering. And thank you so much for your generosity to that. And you're, you're going to be... Um, speeding the way for us to make some great partnership and, and be a blessing to so many other organizations as we partner in 2020. So thank you for your generosity to that. And any time between now and the end of the year, if you still want to give to that offering, we certainly want to encourage you to do that. How many of you excited for 2020 to get here? Maybe it's because you're ready for 2019 to be over. Can I hear a big amen, everybody, right? So somebody like, this year's got to be done. Well, uh, can you believe we're back in the roaring 20s? That's kind of a crazy way to see that, right, everybody? 
Well, 2020 is coming very soon. And as we do every year, we start our year with 21 days of fasting and prayer. And I want to invite everybody in our church to be a part of our fast somehow and join us for prayer every single day. So we'll start that on January 1st and go through the 21st and um, fast in some sort of way. And and there are so many different ways to fast and we'll have some prayer guides for you available. We're we're all getting uh, wristbands that remind us to pray first, then to listen to the Lord and listen to God through his word and as you're praying and then live as a response to what God's directing you in. But we're gonna consecrate this first three weeks of the year to the Lord in prayer. In fact, it's one thing that we've done every year as long as I've been pastor here. And I I believe it's part of the reason God is growing our church and can bless this place uh, because we really dedicate that time first to him. It's not a magic formula. I just think the Lord chooses to bless this church. Now, the fast is a great time to reestablish some disciplines in our lives. Now, some of you are asking already about what kind of fast do I do or what kind of fast should you do? And let me just say, fast something over 21 days. And and I don't think fasting is abstaining from Facebook, even though that will set many of you free. Come on, somebody. I don't think fasting is just getting off social media. That's abstinence. But fasting, biblically and historically, is always about closing your mouth to something. Now, um, some kind of food or intake of something that you put into your body. So maybe you'll fast breakfast or lunch or dinner or uh, do some kind of intermittent fasting. I, I tend to just go all the way and do a total food fast. So I won't eat all day for three weeks. And then in the evening, I'll have a cup of broth, uh, soup broth and some crackers or bread. And um, maybe that's the kind of fast you wanna do as well. I would encourage you to be cautious, drink a lot of water that way, but fast something, fast sweets, chocolate, fast cucumbers. I mean, something really hard. You know what I'm saying? Like squash and onions, just fast some tough stuff. But the purpose of fasting is not a diet. It's to pray. It's to spend time in prayer and to consecrate yourself to the Lord. So we're going to fast and pray for 21 days. And one of the things I want to ask you to do is ask the Lord to stretch you in areas of your devotion life to the Lord. Y'all hear what I'm saying? How many of you ready for 2020 to be a little different in your walk with God? Anybody besides Pastor Mike, right? I I know I I wanna grow in some areas of my personal devotion life. And so I want you to ask the Lord to stretch you in a few areas. And uh, as we prepare to give, I wanna ask you to ask the Lord to stretch you in this area of giving. Now the Bible directs that we be tithers, that we bring the first 10th portion of our income to the Lord and we give that through our local church. Malachi 3 says we give it through the storehouse, right? And for some of us, that's a real challenge, or it's, it's either a step of faith or step of obedience. We just haven't made it there yet, or you're working your way towards that. And I just think that's great. But, but all of us need to ask God, say, God, how would you stretch me in this area of my devotion life? And, and, and the rest of us during 21 days of fasting and prayer, we're going to grow in prayer, in Bible reading, in maybe serving, getting on a team, whatever it is, sharing your faith with others. But in the area of giving, some of you have never tried tithing. And so I want to give you a challenge. And we offer this multiple times throughout the year. We call it our 90 day tithe challenge. Now it sounds like a, a bit of a, a, a sales trick and that's not why, what motivates me. The only place in the Bible where God says we can test him, because you know, the Bible says, don't test the Lord. Don't test God. Anybody ever say that to your kids? Don't you test me, right? The only place in the Bible that we are told to test God is in this area of tithing and then giving offerings. And here's what God says. It's in Malachi chapter three, the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. He says, test me in this, bring the full tithe to your storehouse, right? And he said, so that you're providing for my house. And then he said, and see if I won't. You ever had somebody say, see, say I won't, say I won't, right? God's saying, see if I won't, open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on your life until you have no more needs. And so here's what God says. I want to be involved in your needs. I want to be involved in the needs that you have for your life, the, your budget needs, your health needs, your whatever. He said, see if I don't get involved in taking care of your needs. So here's the test part. Okay, Lord, I'm going to bring a tithe to you for 90 days. And I don't know why we said 90 days. I think somebody told me to try that, and so we did it. But we say try this for 90 days, three months, January, February, March, and bring a tithe to the Lord for 90 days. And see if he doesn't take care of your needs. And here's the offer we make to our church. If God does not take care of your needs, now I'm not talking about your need for a Porsche, (laughs) right? Your need for a a 21 day cruise. I'm talking about your needs. If God doesn't take care of your needs, LifePoint Church will refund all that you've given back to you. And then you and I are gonna meet one-on-one with the Lord and we're gonna pray. And we're gonna say, God, what's the deal? You said, and you didn't come through for this family. What's the deal? What's wrong with you? And let me just tell you, in 10 years of pastoring this church, We've had hundreds of families go through this and try tithing for 90 days and zero people have ever come back and said, we need a refund, never. 
But I just think for some of us, we just need that little encouragement. And, and, and here's the thing, you're not testing me. You're not even testing your spouse. You're testing God. And he said, put me to the test, dare me in this area. So I wanna challenge you as you prepare for 21 days of fasting, 21 days of prayer, ask the Lord to stretch you in whatever area that he wants to, but particularly in this area of giving, Ask the Lord, say, God, are you stretching me here? And then dare him to get involved with taking care of your needs. Can I hear a big amen, everybody? Hey, thanks for your generosity. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to give. We just want to trust your word. God, whatever your word says is what we want to be about. God, all of us could rationalize and argue and say, that's not for me. But God, I believe the word is for us. I believe the word is alive and active and we can count on what you say for us and to us. And so Lord, today, as we prepare to give and we bring offerings and tithes to the Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you will take care of our needs, you'll bless us, and we thank you, God, that we wanna see your kingdom come in this city, in our world, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I love you, church, thanks so much. Hey, good morning and welcome to LifePoint Church. My name is Mike. I get to serve here as lead pastor of our church. And hey, I want to say welcome to all of you who are here for the very first time, as well as everyone who's joining us at any of our locations. We are actually uh, streaming this to multiple places. I want to say what's up to our North Clarksville campus, those of you who are joining us at West Creek Middle School, as well as our Austin P State University campus and our microsites in Tacoma, Washington, and San Antonio, Texas, as well as our online church family, LifePoint. Can we give it up for our whole church family? We're so glad to be together today on this Sunday, on this weekend. Hey, for every location, we wanna say thank you so much for being a part of this church. And uh, next Sunday, December 22nd, at all of our places, we're gonna have our Christmas service, our Christmas weekend service. So I wanna encourage you to invite somebody, have a guest with you, and if you serve, on our dream team, especially in our Clarksville locations, I wanna encourage you to come to our Saturday evening, 5.30 service. It's the same message, same music, same everything, uh, but then give up your seat on Sunday morning and serve, open doors, serving Kid Point, be a part of serving others that are coming. We are expecting a lot of guests, so we know that our services will be fuller than normal as well as even our lobby campus. We're gonna uh, be ready to receive new faces and new people every, at every location. Amen, everybody? Hey, we're gonna jump right into the word today because I wrote too much sermon. You ever write a paper and it's too long and you feel like an overachiever and the teacher's like, I said eight pages, you wrote 12 and they dock you points. Well, that's what happened today. So I wrote too much message, but I wanna get as much of it in as I can for you today. I believe it's gonna be a life-changing talk for you. How many of you glad it's Christmas season? You enjoying kind of the holiday foods already starting and hopefully you got your shopping almost done or close to done or thank God for Amazon, it all just shows up at your house, right? So um, Christmas is the season actually December 24th through January 6th, the, the historical Christmas, 12 days of Christmas season. But, but in preparation for Christmas, churches around the world and historically have celebrated four weeks prior to Christmas Eve, and it's the season called Advent. It's the time of waiting for the visitation or the appearance of Christ, of Messiah. And all of, the, all of the created history was waiting for Christ to appear, actually. And in Jewish tradition, they had all these prophetic writings about the coming of God, the Messiah, to come and be with us. And Isaiah, of course, is one of the most famous passages we'll see in just a moment. But for unto us, a child is born, a son is given, and he would be the wonderful counselor. And so we, we've awaited for a long time, then Christ would come. And actually, we are in the season now that is called the second advent, which is the waiting again of Christ to return. Last Sunday, I shared with you from Titus 2, where Paul writes that we are waiting again on the glorious appearing of Christ, which is our blessed hope. And so last Sunday, we looked at the theme of hope in this Advent season. And today, we're looking at the second theme of Advent, which is the word peace. So we're gonna title the message today, Peace on Earth. How many of you are familiar with times of peace? How many of you are familiar with times of no peace? Come on, somebody, right? I, I'll be honest with you. I can handle a lot of different pressure and stressors in my life and tension, but I'll tell you something that I'm not good at and that absolutely disturbs my peace. It's when I'm sick. 
Anybody else hate to be sick? Like I don't, I can deal with work tension, I can deal with financial pressure, I can deal with relational stress, but when I'm sick, I am a silly giant baby. It's pretty bad, I'm a hypochondriac a little bit, so I always think I'm dying. I feel like my kidney's gonna fall out of my bladder and I feel like I got cancer. I mean, I could have the sniffles and I think I got a tumor in my brain, you know what I'm saying? I don't like to be sick. And as big and tough as you know that I am, when I'm sick, I am a horrible baby. And my wife who's delivered four children would rather do that again than probably put up with me as a sick grown up. Uh, years ago, we, were, we went to a, uh, on a trip to Guatemala, took a few guys from our church. And on the last day, I decided, you know what, man, I haven't had any issues with the water or the food here at all. And I remember brushing my teeth with the tap water in the shower. I was like, come on, give it to me. I, you know, I got so sick. Like I don't, I've never been that sick before or since then, by the way. I mean, violently shaking with fever in the airport sick, like puking in the puke bag of the airplane sick during takeoff. That was awesome, by the way. I figured if you're gonna go, you should go big, and I did. Like, I, I threw up so loud, the pilot, I think, heard it. Felt bad for the flight attendant, because I was just sitting there with puke everywhere, like, would you please help me? I'm gonna die. But I got so sick, it took me three weeks to recover. And uh, I, I had to call in on that Sunday. I couldn't preach. I was so sick. And I am a terrible patient when I'm sick. But the bottom line for me is when I'm, when I'm sick like that, it wrecks my peace. And here's, here's what happens to me. When I'm sick, I want all of you to be sick. I don't think it's fair that you're healthy. I don't like that you're smiling. I look at shows on TV and I see commercials and I'm like, I wish they were all as sick as me and they can all die because I'm going to die. I don't have any peace when I'm sick. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's a bunch of grown men in the room and all their wives are going, oh, it's totally you. I get it. <laughs> I'm a terrible patient. I mean, honestly, I know that about myself. And, but, you know, pick your issue. Pick the thing that robs your peace. Is it family issues? Some of you have some real family stressors and you're, <laughs> you're going into another family meal holiday and you're already at, at, at a lack of peace about it. Could be financial pressures. I mean, we live in a world without peace. Frankly, there's so many things happening around us right now. We're engaged in the longest war in our nation's history. Our political leaders are wrestling to try to impeach our president. Medical bills are stressing us out. Family issues. Maybe you're in the, you, you have a, work, a hectic work schedule or everything wrapped up for school. You don't know what you're going to do with your life next. By the way, congrats to all our Austin P graduates. We're so proud of you guys. But I've heard from some of you, I've heard from some of you and you don't know what's next. Or maybe you're in a, a, a new relationship and this is your first Christmas where you get to show off your new guy and you don't know what people are gonna think about that. Or you're on the back of a painful breakup and this is your first Christmas without that loved one or with, uh, on the back end of the death of a loved one. I'm always conflicted as a pastor between preaching the truth of the word of God, right? That Jesus is the prince of peace, that he is the center of our peace. I'm, I'm conflicted because, between this eternal truth about who Christ is and helping his followers through their times of no peace. Like we have this ideal from the scripture that Jesus is the prince of peace. He offers us peace, but we're living in turmoil and pain and pressure. It's hard reality for many of us and it causes so many different reactions. The Bible says Jesus is our healer. He's our comforter. He's our prince of peace. And I believe it's always God's will that you and I have peace, but how many of you know it's not always in our timing that peace prevails? It's always his will that we have peace, but it's not always in our timing that we finally have peace prevail. Well, with everything you're hoping for this Christmas, what if part of what we hope for is what Christ came to provide, which is hope and peace and love and joy? I wanna challenge you as we look at this uh, theme of peace, like what is robbing your peace and how can Jesus become the center of your life again to bring peace back to you? You know, Jesus actually gave a command about a lack of peace. In Matthew chapter six, he said, I'm telling you, don't worry, don't be anxious, which is essentially the opposite of peace, isn't it? Worry and anxiety. He said, I'm telling you, don't be worryful, don't be worrisome, don't be anxious, but seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and I'll take care of all these issues in your life. But how many of us seek first resolution to our anxiety and our issues and then we bring them to the Lord and we go, God, would you please get involved in this at any time? That'd be great. Jesus said, I'm telling you, don't worry. Don't have anxiety, but seek me. And the peace of God will come and, and all these things will be taken care of you. So this morning as we continue Christmas at Life Point series, the second theme of Advent is the theme of peace. And, and I want us to go to this story about Jesus' birth narrative 
Now, by the way, just as an aside, let me just encourage you families, uh, whether it's with your own kids or your grandkids or, or you're in a gift exchange with anyone else, before you open gifts for Christmas, open the gospel and hear and read and look together at the greatest gift ever given. Before you, we exchange gifts at our house on Christmas morning, we always wait and our kids are so anxious. You know, they're like, come on, come on, dad, get the Bible, let's go. And we open the scripture and we read Luke chapter two. And we tell our kids, man, the greatest gift you've ever received is what God gave to us in the coming of Jesus Christ. So I just wanna encourage you, if you can, let's bring, let's bring that story to the forefront before you open presents. Now, after Jesus is born, uh, his parents do the custom thing, customary thing, and they bring him on his eighth day to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord. Now, you guys were here last Sunday. You, you saw that we do baby dedications. We had them at other locations as well. And that's actually modeled after uh, Sam, Samuel and, and even the life of Jesus. He was dedicated to the Lord at the temple as a baby. We don't baptize babies here, but we dedicate them to the Lord, and it's followed in the pattern of Jesus. So Luke chapter 2 Starting in verse 22, there's this story after Jesus is born that I find we sometimes read through too quickly because we want to get to some miracle or some more powerful story about Jesus. But this is one of the most powerful passages for us when it comes to peace with Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 22, when the time had come for their purification, this is the family with Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb of his mother, in other words, the firstborn child, especially of, the, of a mom, uh, every son, firstborn son, shall be called holy to the Lord. So they brought him to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. This is in the, the Old Testament Levitical law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, verse 25 says, there was a man in Jerusalem, so they're bringing Jesus up to Jerusalem from Nazareth, right? So baby Jesus is born, Mary and Joseph are going up here to bring him and bring an offering to the Lord as a thanks for this firstborn son. And in Jerusalem, there is a man named Simeon. Everybody say Simeon. Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel or the, the healing or the satisfaction for Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death. He would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, this is a very interesting passage, okay? Jesus has been born. The, we, we've already lived through the, you know, the shepherds in the field and the star and the donkey out in the field, you know, and the, the manger scene and all that. Eight days later, now they're going up to the temple. And as they're going to the temple to, to, to offer sacrifice for the birth of this firstborn son, an angel or the Holy Spirit had already spoken to this old man at the temple named Simeon. In fact, that's, that's kind of how he's referenced, the old man at the temple, Simeon. And here's the first thing that we see about peace. Peace is not something that you can earn. Peace is not something that Simeon earned. Peace was not something that our behaviors would warrant for us. Go back to the text and read, read with me again. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and look what it says about him. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. How many of you would like that to be your reputation? How many of you that's not your reputation? <laughs> yeah, a bunch of you aren't raising your hands because you're liars because you're not righteous or devout, right? Okay, so anyway, that was a joke. So here's what they said about Simeon. Don't be offended, it's not righteous. <laughs> he was righteous, which means he had right standing with God. He behaved rightly. He had uh, disciplined behavioral ethics. And he was devout, which means he showed up for temple. He always showed up for services. He was faithful in his covenant and commitment to God. So those are some great attributes of this guy, Simeon. I mean, it was so strong that they wrote this about him in the Bible. It's one thing to have that reputation like on the street or with your friends. It's another thing to have that reputation and it made the scripture. You know what I'm saying? So it says he had great behavior and dedication and he was super committed to his faith 
and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So he was a guy known to have right standing, good behavior, devout, waiting on the savior of the world and the Holy Spirit was on him. That is an incredible testimony and description. But here's what we understand as we move forward in the text, that although he was all of these things, he had good behavior, he had good disciplines, he had good attendance, and even though the Holy Spirit was a part of his life, here's what he didn't have, peace from God. He didn't have peace with the Lord. In fact, we go on to see in the text that peace comes as a result of him meeting the Christ. But listen, even though all these things were true about him, he didn't have peace. He was waiting on peace. It literally says he was waiting on the consolation or the, clo- the peace for the whole nation of Israel. Even though he was righteous and devout, he was waiting on peace to come. Waiting on the Lord's Christ, waiting on the Messiah. And he was a good Jewish man, which means he knew the Old Testament. He knew the stories and the prophecies and the law. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says this about this coming Christ that he had been waiting on. Hundreds of years prior to Luke chapter 2, Isaiah writes this prophetic word. He says, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. In other words, in other words all authority and all reign and rule will be on him. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There's no end to the peace that comes with Jesus. Now here's Simeon, this old righteous man. He's super devout. He's very faithful to his covenant and his commitment to God and the Holy Spirit's on him. And yet still he's waiting on this peace to come. Are y'all tracking with what I'm saying here? Even though he behaved well, listen to me, even though he was a good guy, he didn't have real peace with God. And I'm going to tell you, we all want peace. We all want to have peaceful home, lives, jobs, and ultimately, we want to know that we have peace with God. Can I tell you something? We want to know that we're good with God, but you can't earn it by being good in yourself. You can't earn peace from God. You can't earn the consolation of, of, of righteousness and peace with God simply by being a good guy, being a righteous person, having good church attendance, and doing other religious practices. We can't fabricate peace. We can't, we can't put that out to God and say, well, I'm at peace with myself, so I've got peace with God. Isaiah said, all of our efforts, all of our religion and our righteous efforts and our devotion, all of it is like filthy rags apart from God. That is, our efforts don't produce what only God can produce. And if we desire peace with God, listen to me, if we desire peace in our lives, peace in our homes, we can't fabricate it and we can't earn it and we can't make it appear. I love that this was his testimony, but even the most righteous guy in the temple that day, even the most devout guy, the guy who was led by the Spirit, was still waiting for this peace to come. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is a guy, he's tracking with the Lord. I'm not saying he was some hellbound hypocrite. He was tracking with God, but he still didn't have peace. Watch this. He was told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, that Christ that they're waiting on for hundreds of years as a nation. How many of you would like to know the day you're gonna die, right? That's like this old question, like wouldn't you like to know and then you can live it up until then? Well, this guy knew he wasn't gonna die until he'd seen Christ. So every day it's like, well, I ain't seen Jesus yet, so what you got for me? You know what I'm saying? I ain't afraid to die today because I'm not gonna. That's a lot funnier to me than it was to you, that's cool. The Spirit of God told him, he said, you're not going to die until you see the Christ. Which, by the way, once he sees him, he's probably like, take me now, Lord, I'm ready. And so here's what happens. He couldn't earn it by his righteousness. He's still waiting on the consolation, the, the, the closure to the things of God. And then we see Jesus become the center of his true peace. Watch what happens in verse 27. So he came in the Spirit, capital S in your Bible too, right? So he came in the Spirit into the temple. Now, when the parents brought in the child Jesus, which is to do according to the custom of the law, Simeon took this baby in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now, look what he said, now, not before, not later, finally, here in this moment, now you are letting your servant depart in what? peace. Why? Because the Lord said, you will not die until you've seen the Lord's Christ. And now Simeon grabs this little eight day old baby. Any new moms, first time moms are already shuddering at this. You're like, oh no, don't touch my baby. Don't take him out of the car seat. Have you washed your hands? Did you Purell them hands? Oh man. Like any new mom would be freaking out right now, right? 
But Simeon, full of the spirit, people knew his reputation. He grabs Jesus, holds him close, and finally sees the Lord's Christ and says to God, now I've seen the Lord, now I can die in peace. This is the salvation, he says. My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people. Can I just tell you that God's salvation, again, it's for all people. It is a light for revelation to the Gentiles, which is every one of us that aren't Jewish, shalom, and for glory to your people, Israel. So here he's saying, I've seen the Lord's Christ. This is salvation prepared for all folks. It's revelation to the Gentile, to the non-Jew. And now this is for the glory of your people, Israel. In other words, this is a story that comes out of Israel. This is our guy. And now he's for all people. I love this picture. Simeon grabs this baby. He's eight days old. He's the promised savior to this young mother, Mary. She's probably thinking, don't touch him, don't touch him. I don't want to break him. God told me to raise this kid as his own. Who are you, old man, right? And he grabs this baby and he says, look, Lord, now you are letting your servant die in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. How amazing was it that he was able to see Jesus? I mean, before Jesus was anything. Jesus hadn't done a miracle. He hadn't preached a sermon. He hadn't called his mom a woman yet. I mean, he hadn't done anything special. But this is the one that he was waiting for his entire life. And now he says, now, as devoted and righteous and full of the Holy Spirit that he was, he had longed and waited to meet Jesus. Now listen, here's why I think this is important. Simeon couldn't die in peace because of his righteous behavior. Simeon couldn't die in peace because he was devout to the temple. He was devout to the traditions. He could only find peace when he met Jesus. Did you hear what I said? Simeon could only find peace when he finally met Jesus. And that became the ultimate fulfillment of his life. At this point, he's like, live or die now. It doesn't matter. I've met Jesus. I've met the Christ. My peace is complete. And he will be the center of our peace as well. As a pastor, I've just seen over and over again how people who are good people, they're devout in their behaviors. They're faithful to the system. They're faithful to show up and serve and give. And all these different righteous behaviors, we go through the right motions, but we have no peace with God because really we've never met Jesus who we're working so hard for. I preached this last January as our first sermon of the year out of Revelation chapter two where Jesus said, I see your works. I love what you're doing. You're holding leadership accountable. You're doing all the right things. And then he says, you're doing it in my name for my namesake. And Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, he goes, but here's the one thing I have against you. You're doing all the right things for me. You just don't love me. And can I tell you, religion and religious expressions of Christianity have taught us to be devoted, have taught us to walk in righteousness. Don't talk like that here. Don't listen to those things. Don't act this way, that way, and and in this place and that place. But righteous behavior and devote behaviors do not produce peace for us. Only meeting Jesus produces peace in you. Every religion in the world tries to teach us how to devote ourselves and to righteousness ourselves into relationship with God. But only Christianity says Christ would come to us and meet us here in our place to bring us peace with God. Simeon says, man, all my behaviors, all my righteous attitudes, all my good deeds, I've met Jesus and now I have peace with God. Man, so many of us were good people We're righteous, we're devout, we're structured, we're moral. Even good church attenders and servers. Some of us have had great moments with God or sensed his presence and his drawing to us, but have you really, listen, have you really met the Lord Jesus? I remember in college I was friends with a girl. I think I was more friends with her than she was with me, but it's okay. I don't know where she's at now, I don't really care. But I remember we were talking one time, we were having lunch and and, and I was, like, I was a young Christian, super passionate for the things of God. And I remember, like, I, I just wanted to know God. I wanted to know Christ. And we were having this conversation on something theological, I don't know. And I remember saying this comment to her. I was like, yeah, but, I mean, I know God. I know what his word says. And she says, no, you don't know God. You can't know God. And I'll just never forget that startled me thinking, I, th- I thought we could know the Lord. I thought we, I th- we, could, I thought we could have a relationship with Jesus. <laughs> she says, you don't know God. We can't know him like that. 
But that is such a lie, and some of you have lived into that lie. You, we, we get caught up in these beliefs that if we can just behave well enough, if we can attend regular enough, if we let the good outweigh the bad enough, come on, somebody, I'm talking to somebody here, that somehow God will kind of check us in and make sure that we get in, at least in the back door. But I just want to ask you, have you really met the Lord? Do you know him? Do you live with him? Do you follow him? Do you, are you devoted to intimacy with him? Have you embraced Christ? I love that picture of Simeon. He took their baby from him and held him. I mean, have you, have you had an intimacy level with Jesus like that? Now, obviously, you can't literally grab Jesus. I think he's got security or something. I don't know. Is this making sense, what I'm saying to you guys? For some of us, if we're really honest, we think we'll have peace with God. Now, listen, I'm going to offend some people right now. Some of us think we'll finally get peace with God if we can just get him to be okay with whatever we're doing. If I could just get God to give me like a five minute conversation to let him know my heart, because you know God knows my heart. <laughs> yeah, it's wicked. That's why he sent Jesus. But some of us think we'll have peace with God if we can get him to be okay with whatever we're doing. We don't have peace because we know, listen, we know we're living outside of his will. We know we're living outside of the word of God. We know we're living out, and we say things like, well, culture's changed. People are different. They don't live that way anymore. I'm sorry. God never changes. And we think we'll get peace with God if we could just get at least God's people to be okay with our sin, if we can get God's people to be okay with what we're doing. Listen, you will never change God. Never. You'll never change God's heart when it comes to how you're living and what he expects from you. Sometimes we think that peace is having God sterilize our brokenness. That is, we think if we can just get him to be okay with what we're struggling with or the lifestyle we're living in or the choices we're making, if we can just remind God, hey, you're the grace guy. Come on, give me some grace today. If we can just get God to bend some of them old-fashioned religion rules, if we can just get God to put his blessing on our messes, then we'll have peace. You can't earn peace. You can't force peace. Let me say something to you that might really offend some of you. Peace will not come from you convincing God to sterilize your brokenness. Peace will only come when you surrender your mess to him, when you commit to living in his ways and in his will instead of your own. This is a powerful exchange of peace. When we choose to submit our way to God's way, when we submit our will to his and we submit our lives to the word of God and humbly acknowledge that there is a peace with God when we surrender ourselves to God. I've given up my rights. We give up our opinions. Somebody asks me, I mean, I get asked this often, you know, pastor, what do you think about so-and-so? What do you think about this new thing happening in our culture? What do you think about these laws being passed? And I go, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God's word says. I have opinions that don't match God's word. And you know what I do? I submit those opinions to God's word. I go, those opinions don't matter anymore. You ever have a religious debate with somebody and they always start with, well, I think, well, personally, here's what I think. Shh, shut it. I don't want to hear what you think. I mean, I will graciously listen. Mm, that is brilliant. Well thought out. Hmm, you don't say. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter what we think. There's an old uh, art of war statement that many of us have bought into. It says, if you want peace, prepare for war. Any of y'all ever heard that? Anybody that's ever been in conflict, you've probably seen that or heard that. But the reality is in the kingdom of God, if you want peace, prepare to surrender your life to Jesus. And that's what Simeon did. He lifts up this Christ and he's like, finally, Lord, I can die in peace because I have met Christ. And some of us want righteousness and devoutness and we want all the right behaviors, but we want to have it our own way. And you will never have peace with God trying to be your own God. You have to surrender to the Lord. It's the way it works. I've given up my right to be in charge of my life. I've given up my own right to run my budget or run how I live my life. I don't get to fit into culture or try to make peace with my own self. We have this mantra, you just be your best you. You just be your true self. I don't want to be my true self because my true self is going to hell. But because of Jesus, I'm going to heaven. I don't want to have peace. I, I want to have peace with God. I don't need peace with culture. I need peace with God. And that only comes through surrender to Jesus. He's completely other than us. And in every way of struggle that we struggle with peace, Jesus will bring clarity in his solution to your life of peace, your need for peace. Are y'all tracking with what I'm saying? Now listen, 
for the final part of this talk, I just, I want to challenge some of us to change the way we view peace with God. Because some of us are like, well, if I can just hang on to heaven, I'll have peace when this is all over. How many of y'all got the sweet by and by attitude about life? Man, this life is hard. And some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. That's how white people clap for that song. See, <laughs> black folks are like, we don't clap on one and three. No, we don't do it like that. Some of us have this attitude that we're just going to hang on to heaven. Man, we'll make it one day. That's just not the life of peace that God is offering for you. Can I just start by telling you that Christ came to bring peace for your past? Now, this, somebody here needs to hear this. And it may be your recent past or your long ago past. Jesus has come to bring peace for that. When he hung on the cross and he prays to the Lord, he says, God, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Man, he gave his life for every sin, listen to me, you've ever committed. There is nothing, and I, I just want you to hear this, there is nothing in this world you have ever done that Christ will not forgive. Nothing, there's nothing. And I know in a military town, we have a bunch of our soldiers that have wrestled with this statement that I'm making right now. In fact, I want to uh, give you an update for a couple years old story that I shared about a guy named Q. He was a part of our church, and I met him in the back row of our old building uh, here at our Rossview campus. And Q came to me one day just totally distraught. He's about my size, big old guy, man. He's just big old teddy bear, super strong teddy bear. I met him and he gives me this hug and I swear my soul left my body for a minute. I was like, I gotta breathe, I can't breathe. And I met him and he was in tears. I said, what's the deal, man? And he was with one of our guys here on staff and, and he's like, man, I, I just don't think I can ever be forgiven. I've seen some things and I've done some things. He was in combat with a special group that's not known and, and he had to do some really awful things in combat. And Q came to me, he's like, I don't, I can't, I can't stand myself. I can't live this life. I don't know what I'm gonna do. So we, we started meeting with, talking with, praying with Q and got him into a small group and we're discipling him and he just could not let go of the fact that some of the things he had done, God would never forgive. I get a call from him one day. He had turned to a bunch of things to medicate that pain. I get a call from him one day, probably about a year later or so after that soul wrenching hug. And he says to me, he calls me, he says, pastor, it's Q is his, not his name, but that's what I'm calling him for you. He said, I just have a question. I said, where are you calling me from? I didn't recognize the number. He said, I'm not telling you where I'm calling you from. I'm on a pay phone. Don't worry about it. And he said, I need to know if I go off the grid and live on the streets for the rest of my life, will I go to hell when I die? I said, what are you talking about? He said, I'm not going to talk to anybody else in the, whole, in the rest of my life. I'm not talking to my family. I'll never talk to you again. You'll never hear from me again. I just want to know if I go live under a bridge or on the streets. I, I'm, I'm so full of guilt and grief. If I go live on the streets for the rest of my life, will I go to hell when I die? Because if I'm going to go to hell then, he said, I'm just going to take my own life and go to hell now. Now I'm on the phone. I'm like, where are you? I will come anywhere in the country. Just tell me where you are. I'll come to you right now. Just answer my question, Pastor Mike. He's as calm as can be. He said, I just want to know, I can't live with my past. I'm just going to, I'm disappearing. You'll, I'll never bother you again. I said, you're not bothering me. Just tell me where you are. I'll come to you right now. I'm just telling me if I'm going to die and go to hell if I go off the grid. I said, you're not going to go to hell for being a loner. I mean, I'm just, okay, thank you. <laughs> Hung up. Star 69, and I'm trying to call this number back. I have no idea where he's at. I'm calling like friends. I'm like, where is this pay phone's pinging out of like Djibouti? I don't know where it's at. That's a country, not a slang. <laughs> so Q is gone. About a year later, Q calls me. Man, it's so refreshing to hear him. And Blaine and I had been discipling him, and he's like, well, that didn't work. I'm just, he's just so lost and broken. And he kept going back to what he had done in combat and what he'd done in his past. I said, man, we're going to put you in treatment. Come here, we'll take you, I'll drive you myself. We did. Blaine and I took him down to treatment in Dixon through the Hope Center, which you faithfully support every month by your giving. Thank you so much for that. And Q got to go into treatment and he got kicked out a week later because he beat a guy almost to death. It was really kind of embarrassing. I'm like, Jew, man, come on. So we ended up putting him in another treatment center in Chattanooga, 
which your faithfulness and generosity supports every month. Thank you so much. And that's where Q met the Lord. And about three, hang on, about three weeks ago, I get a text from Q. And he sends me a video of him singing the old rugged cross at First Baptist Church in whatever city in Alabama in a suit and tie. And his eyes are bright. And he shares in the middle. He's got this big, deep voice. On a hill far away. I can't even do it. It's so low. And in the middle, in the break, he said, I've done a lot of things in my life. But how many of you know I met the Lord? And he changed my life. I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you've ever done. There's nothing you've ever done that God won't forgive and heal and bring you peace in your life. I'm telling you, God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's for you, not against you. You and I need to realize that peace from God, some of us need peace from our past. Some of us have never forgiven ourselves for the things we've done. Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our sin, our transgressions from us. In other words, it is so far removed from God's mind. Why do you keep replaying the video? Why do you keep living back in? You bring it up every day. I can't believe I did this. And God's going, what are you even talking about? I don't even know what you're referring to because I forgot about that. God is a forgiving God and you can have peace with God if you'll start believing that Jesus came to give you forgiveness and freedom from all of that stuff. It's cool. I'm preaching better than you. you're shouting. I'll shout. Them. Come on, help me out of our other campuses. God's not mad at you. He's for you. Stop doing it and be at peace. Man, I love that Jesus always had that same attitude towards people caught in sin. The woman caught in adultery, right? Nicodemus, the religious guy. Both, both of them came, you know, they're put before Jesus. One of them is deserving of stoning to death. The other guy was trying to, his whole crew was trying to stone Jesus. And both people, Nicodemus and John 3 and the woman caught in adultery, he says the same thing. Leave that life and follow me. Can I just tell you something, guys? Whatever you're doing in, whatever your past looks like, leave that life and follow Jesus. Find peace from your past. He brings peace for your present. Man, there is no doubt. If you look at cable news or one glance in the newspaper, you can get your heart into a state of no peace. There's so much to be anxious about. I don't even like watching the news anymore because there's only one fun story out of 50 Political scandals, impeachment, local crime, murders, human trafficking, broken systems, doomsday reports about the future of social security. I was watching a documentary about ve being a vegan and all of a sudden I'm feeling guilty about eating a steak like my kidneys are going to explode. <laughs> I don't have any peace right now. Man, the problem is steak is so delicious. <laughs> you put that next to celery, it's no contest. <laughs> Plenty of reasons to look around in life and be unsettled. Beyond what's happening out there, many of you have personal issues, family problems, marriage, finance, church conflicts, neighborhood feuds, get off my property. I know for me, there's times as a pastor and a leader, it seems I just cannot get peace. I wonder about our impact as a church, our growth. How are we gonna find more seats? Who's gonna help us pay for this dang place? Being formed or how are relationships being formed or wounded? And man, are we doing good, Lord? Are we, how do we build for our North Campus? What's gonna happen at Ospie? Always remember the scripture my next door neighbor used to teach me as a kid. I didn't grow up in a church family. We were religious Southern churchy folk. You know, you brush out your mullet for Easter and you go to church in a silk shirt. <laughs> it's true. My neighbor, Sheila, she was five feet tall. And her husband was a mountain man. I mean, he had a beard down to here. He was all country as can be. And she was this sweet little church lady. I used to say she's country as cornbread, man. Sheila. And my brothers and I fought a lot. And we always took our fights to the front yard. You know what I'm saying? Or we'd take them out of the house. We'd run out screaming, cussing, yelling, whatever. And I remember Sheila would get a hold of you later. And she'd go, now, peace be still. Like, I don't even know that many syllables on three words. Peace be still. She'd say, peace be still. And that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. See, in Mark chapter four, there's a story where the disciples are in a, in a uh, they just got done feeding thousands with a lunchbox. And y'all remember that story, right? And Jesus says to the disciples, he goes, let's get in the boat. We're gonna go across the Galilee. We're going over there. How many of you know if Jesus says, we're going over there, you're probably going over there. 
And they get in the Galilee, it's the middle of the night, and the, the Sea of Galilee is known for these crazy storms that r- almost swells like an ocean storm, even though it's a lake, right? Well, Jesus is up in the front of the boat on some cushions, just dozing, straight up out cold. And all 12 disciples are in this boat, freaking out. They're throwing water out. They literally are panicking, thinking they're going to die. The boat's up and down like this. Jesus is out cold. And they come and wake Jesus up, and they go, Master, wake up, we're going to (laughs) die. He just walks up to the front of the boat, and he says, peace, be still. And the storm just settled. And the disciples kind of freak out. They're like, he even calms the storms. And Jesus looked back at them and he rebukes them. He doesn't go, y'all good? Can I go back to sleep now? He takes this as a teaching moment. And I think this is the moment you guys need to understand. He looks back at them and he says, do you not remember what I just did feeding thousands with a Lunchable? (laughs) And then it's like, He goes, I just told you at the beginning of this journey, we are going over there. Did you think I was going to die in a boat? I'm going to a cross in a year. What y'all's problem? What's your problem? And he looks at him and he says, why do you have such little faith? Now, look, I would understand a lack of faith if he wasn't in the boat, but he's in the boat. I ain't going out like this, sucker. I told you we're going over there. Do you not remember just... 22 hours ago, I fed thousands with nothing. Why do you have such little faith? It's because they forgot who was with them in the storm. Can I tell you something? Peace is not about you going through life with no storms. Peace is about knowing who's in the boat when you are going through the storm. We bought into this lie as Christians that if I say yes to Jesus, I'll never have problems. That's wrong. But peace comes from knowing who's with you in the storm. When you look to Jesus and go, Lord, speak peace. Let it be still in my life. Though everything be falling apart around me, I am sure that Christ is with me and he is the center of my peace. Man, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know. Some of you have some really bad health things going on with you. Some of you have relationship problems that are completely falling apart, or you don't know what's the next season of your life. Can I tell you, if Christ is with you, and this is the reason we don't have peace, because we're trying to navigate these waters without him. But if Christ is with you, listen, don't be anxious for anything. In everything, put the Lord first and let him speak peace. Peace to your medical bills, peace to your marriage problems, peace to your grief and your loss, peace. Be still. Sometimes we look so much at the storm, we need to just look at old sleepy Jesus up there (laughs) and go, if he be with me, who can be against me? Man, it might be really tumultuous in your present situation, but I'm here to tell you, God's with you. Finally, Christ came to bring peace for our future. And I, I just want you to understand the eschatological reality here. That's a fancy word for end times. See, our future in Christ is secure. If you belong to Jesus, you belong to Jesus. In Psalm 118, verse 6, it says, The Lord is on my side. Can I just remind all of you to just say this every day? The Lord is on my side. Say it with me right now. Come on, say, the Lord is on my side. Say it again. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. I love how Simeon's attitude was, take me now, Lord. I don't care how I die. I don't care. This was Paul's approach to life with Christ. He's like, kill me, beat me, throw me in a, sh- you know, a shipwreck, whatever you got to do. Because I know that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. My end is secure. I am confident that my peace, this place is not all there is. This isn't my permanent home. Some glad morning, when this life is over, I will fly away and I will be with the Lord forever. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that we are heirs with Christ. We are sons and daughters of the most high God. Look what Paul writes in Titus. I feel like I'm yelling. Am I yelling? I'm like all antsy over here. (laughs) Like, come at me, devil. All right, when the goodness... When the loving kindness, I gave you Titus 2 last week, right? The grace of God has appeared, and now we wait on the reappearing again of Jesus, our blessed hope. Now in chapter 3, he says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, this is Jesus, he saved us. Look at this. Not because of any works that we have done by our own righteousness, but according to his own mercy. 
And the washing of regeneration and renewal, he's changing you. He's wrecking your life. He's making you new, right? And renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior. So that being justified, that means set right. That means bills are paid. That's what justification is, essentially. It means you have been justified before God. Your bill has paid. Your, your portion is taken care of. We've been justified by his grace we might now, so that being justified by his grace, we might now become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let me just assure you of something. Your eternal life is now and forever. Your eternal life means eternal living. And you can be sure about this. We are justified and now we are heirs. Here's the thing. Many of us don't have peace because we forgot we're sons. Many of us don't have peace in this world because we forgot who our daddy is. We forgot that we're daughters of the most high God, that what can anybody do to me? Greater is he that's in me. I'm more than a conqueror in Christ. I'm an overcomer. Come at me, devil. Come at me, world. You can't shake somebody who knows their future is with the Lord forever. Our peace is forever. We are heirs of God for eternal life. What has this life possibly got to throw at you that would be so stressful that you would lose your sonship or daughtership to the king of eternity? What's so stressful that we would take our eyes off Jesus long enough to lose sight of the prince of peace? Paul said we're co-heirs with Christ. We are also to be in heaven with him forever. It's the joy that comes in funerals that to be absent from this body is actually to be present with the Lord. I've shared this at funerals. We had a, a young mom die way too soon. And I stood right here and I said, but if she could look back at us from heaven right now, she could peel back the curtain. She'd go, this place is awesome. I don't know what you're freaking, freaking out about and crying over me for. This is great. We've got to keep an eternal perspective as heirs and co-heirs with Christ, sons and daughters of the Lord. So hey, as I think about our church and I think about us at multiple locations and what God's doing here, many of us are struggling. We've got past issues. We're dealing with some pressure right now. And some of us don't know for sure where we're heading into the afterlife. Can I just encourage you to look to Jesus like Simeon, get alone with Christ and let your peace, let your cup flow with peace that comes from the Lord. I love that he grabbed this baby and he got his eyes on Jesus. And I wanna challenge you as you finish out this text today, that you come away with Christ between now and the end of this year, and that you establish some ways in 2020 that you're gonna get your eyes more on Christ, looking to him, the author, the perfecter of your faith. Paul writes this to the Philippian church. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. How many of you have made that conditional on peaceful times? Well, I praise God when it's good. He said, rejoice always. And then he goes, again, I say. Why did he say it twice? Because we don't listen. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That's a great standalone message all by itself. The Lord's at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. This is the opposite of peace. But in everything, by prayer, supplication, which is submission and surrender, and with thanksgiving, Lord, I thank you. In the middle of this treacherous time of my life, I'm thankful to you. Here's what he says. Submit your request. Let your request be made known to God. And then look here, the peace of God. How many of you know God is always at peace? Did you hear what I said? God is always at peace. He's never nervous. He's never wringing his hands going, I don't know, Gabriel, how we're going to get through this one. Man, we better pray in the name of me. I don't know. It's just not going to. Here's what he said. The peace that flows from God will guard your heart, will guard your mind in who? Christ Jesus. See, we gotta get our eyes back on Jesus like Simeon. So as you prep for this year of 2020 and resolutions there, I wanna ask you to devote some discipline to your prayer life to get your eyes on Jesus. I wanna ask you to get your Bible off the dashboard or off the shelf and start reading the words of Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the word of God. Get your eyes on Christ in your prayer closet, in the scripture. Get your eyes on Jesus. Be in church. Be a part of the body. Quit saying, well, you know, I, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. That's just 
horrible motivation anyway. I get to go to church because I'm a Christian. Y'all get to put up with me because you're growing in your Christianity too. I don't want to go to church. It's full of hypocrites. We ain't full yet. And where else do you want hypocrites to be? I mean, Jesus' whole crew was all hypocrites. Every one of them. I'm going to do a series this year on Peter. You're going to see that dude had foot and mouth syndrome constantly. He was a total hypocrite, a racist. He had all kinds of issues, and God still kept him close. Get your eyes on Jesus, the center of your peace, the peace from God, of God. In the original Greek language, this is a case called the dative case. Of, from, and through God. It's the same peace that God has. That's what guards your mind your heart. It surpasses understanding. It doesn't make sense. How in the world are you at peace at a funeral? How are you at peace when your job is unsure? Because my confidence is in the Lord. I'm setting my eyes on Jesus. And the peace of God guards my heart and mind. Lord, we honor you this morning. We honor your word today. We thank you for the peace of God that passes understanding, that it will guard our heart It'll guard our mind and it comes in Jesus. So Lord, draw us back to Jesus. Draw us to our prayer closet. Draw us back to scripture. Draw us back to devotion, to the body of Christ. Draw us back to you, Lord God. We choose today, like Colossians 2 says, to set our minds on things of heaven, not the things of this earth. We're gonna, if we set our minds here on earth, it'll it'll disrupt our peace, God. It'll confuse us and frustrate us and make us angry, Lord God. But we're gonna set our minds on Jesus. Hebrews says to cast our gaze, to set our minds on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And Lord, we're choosing to do that as a body today. At every location, I wanna ask you to pray this with me. And our campus pastors are gonna come and give you some next steps, especially if you need prayer for any place of peace in your life, for your past, present, or future, and you want somebody to pray with you, I wanna ask you to let us pray with you for that at every location. But I wanna ask you if you would, before they come, would you open your hands to the Lord? Come on and pray this with me. Say, God, I believe that Jesus came to give me true peace. Say, I receive his forgiveness, I receive his salvation, and I receive God's peace that surpasses understanding, that it guards my heart, it guards my mind as a child of the most high God. And I will walk with you and live for you for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give the Lord praise today. Amen.